Four Degrees to the Streets is designed to empower anyone curious about places and spaces, not just persons with professional degrees or backgrounds. Here we will cover a host of topics, including transportation, health, housing, and the environment through the lens of racism, classism, and sexism, and give listeners the tools they need to overcome institutional barriers. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the number four degrees pod and tune in every other Tuesday where Nemo and Jazz keep it four degrees to the streets. Welcome back to the Four Degrees to the Streets podcast. My name is Nemo. And I'm Jasmine. And this is actually our first time recording in person. We started this a few months ago after two years of, you know, just talking about it. And so now we're finally here in person. Today we're recording episode eight, Where the Money Reside. Where the money reside, (laughs) where the money reside. And that's why Mary had a little lamb. But shout out to our (laughs) studio space, Camp Space. It's a Black-owned content and podcast studio based in Hyattsville, Maryland, in the DMV. Also, shout out to our video producer and director, June Mugo. You can find her at Vibes by June. And last but not least, shout out to our audio engineer, Ty. And you guys can find him at Ty Just Show Love. So how are you doing today, Jasmine? I'm doing good. I'm happy to be in D.C. Haven't gone to the capital area yet, so trying to stay away from all things military. <laughs> yeah, it's still not quite together. So. But I'm excited for today's episode. Like Nemo says, the first time we're doing a live and in-person episode. We're going to be talking about the local government budget process. The main takeaway for this episode is to demystify the local government budget process. And so we'll go through the steps that local governments take like a city or a town go through to acquire their general fund. And we'll work through each of those steps in turn. So the first step in the budget process is formulation. It's all about figuring out what your expenses and your revenues are going to be. The entire budget process usually runs from June to July of the same year, except if you're in D.C. or the federal government, which is like October to September. So in that budget, in the formulation process, each of the different departments, the Parks Department, the Police Department, the Fire, they all decide what their expenses are going to be. They submit that to the director. The director then submits it to whatever is a legislative body, the city council or whatever committee exists in that space. From there, the committee starts working on a revenue projection for the city and figuring out how much property taxes, sales taxes, Um, hotel taxes, entertainment taxes they can charge, and how much revenue they'll accumulate in general. There's different methods to kind of work through that revenue projection, linear regression, estimation, trend lines. It's important to note that the largest piece of a local government budget comes from intergovernmental transfer. So the Urban Institute State and Local Finance Initiative has a directory that describes America's cities, 36% of a local government's budget comes from intergovernmental transfers, that being state and federal government. Most of that comes from the state, as you're probably aware of, 32% from the state. The second largest is from property taxes, so um, commercial property taxes, residential property taxes, and then 18% actually comes from charges, so water and sewer charges, airport transportation fees, even tickets that they administer like when you violate a parking agreement. Um, Once they go through the expenses and the revenue projection, they basically have the preliminary budget that they then submit to the legislative body. And tell us what happens there, Nemo. Yeah, so what Jasmine just described, like, that is no easy lift. A lot of times in the cities, they're like, this is budget season. Like, we have no time. It's all hands on deck right now. But after doing all that work to put the budget together, after the budget is finalized, it has to be legally approved and adopted. And so most of the time that happens by a city council or a board. Um, depending on the structure. Um, and so if the city is the mayor, is kind of the strong mayor system, then the mayor leads that process. Or it also can be the city manager who kind of leads the operations of the city. They can do that and then have the mayor review. But regardless of having the executive body and their input in the budget, it has to go through the town city mm-hmm. council. And so the council will approve it, and then it becomes a legally binding document. And a lot of times why they kind of have the varying powers at play is because of tenure. So you wouldn't want someone doing the budget for the city who's only been around for a year. Absolutely or, not. <laughs> right, or someone who can just come in and, you know, make a different decision based on what they knew at a pro- in a previous jurisdiction. So the tenure and experience is definitely important when it comes to that budget budget preparation. Um, so for the council review, 
there's different committees. And so before they can even pass it, there's like a committee on health, a committee on education. Um, I don't think what else. Transportation. <laughs> Transportation, economic development. Yeah. So they all meet separately to discuss what they want to have in the budget. And they create their own drafts and then they release that to the public. And that's when the public has a chance to comment on those um, and provide feedback. They take that, provide different drafts, and then that's what they finally vote on. And so the last piece of that, too, is that, you know, taking the body of the budget and passing it, it has to also be balanced. The revenue that they said that is going to be included has to be verified. Um, and that's by law. And so once they can verify all of those different pieces in the budget, you have to execute it. And when I think about execution, like there's not a lot of razzle dazzle <laughs> in it. Um, but to me, it's the part that impacts residents and services that like, mm -hmm. you know, if the budget is not properly being executed and implemented, all the things that the mayor may be promising is going to come out from the city may not actually come. So for execution, there's three main components that I'm going to talk about. There's the monitoring, the adjusting, and the reporting. And so the monitoring, that has to happen from the start. So agencies will create spending plans, they'll, and then they'll, they'll look at the spending plans and then see against their actual spending. And they do this on a monthly, quarterly basis. At any time, they're basically asked to. And so with this projected spending, they can look at if they have a surplus, if they have a deficit, or if they have pressures. And so some pressures may be, for instance, there could be a lot of events happening in the city, pre-COVID, obviously, where they might be using more overtime. And COVID itself could be a pressure. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going yeah, to get into that <laughs> throughout the execution process. Um, they might have maintenance. A school building might have something that mm -hmm. just completely went away, and they didn't have that funding. And so they're going to have to find a way to solve that through the execution and also another piece is shortfall. You can have revenue expected, but a lot of things happen. A few years ago, the government shut down for over a month. Those are people who are not taking public transportation. They're not taking lifts. You know, they're not parking. The city saw a significant, you know, revenue decline from that or mm -hmm. wherever people are working. They're not going to businesses. So all of those things. And so when you have the problems, how do you solve them? A lot of times that happens through the adjustment process. So departments can use a reprogramming. And so say, for instance, they have a contract that they need to pay for, but they're, for some reason, an increased cost. But maybe they have five open positions in their office that they're not going to fill. They can use the funding that they would have used for those positions and transfer that to pay for the contract. So that's one of the ways that- Is agencies, there a lot of flex space in that? Um, as long as, you, you know, you know that you can't go over what you going to pay people salaries mm -hmm. for, <laughs> like, you have to be mindful of that. Um, but if it's necessary, that reprogramming has a longer kind of approval process. But it's possible, you know, mm -hmm. you can write a memo, write a form describing, describing the specific line items that are going to be adjusted, um, and then that can be approved. Um, and then there's also a supplemental budget process. So that would modify the existing fiscal year. So say we're in fiscal year 2021, there can basically be an, not so much an overhaul, but it can modify specific things in the budget that were unaccounted for. Now there's- Which is coronavirus. Right. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot with that. But to be- um, conscious, you can't use a supplemental budget for something you knew was going to come up because that's, you know, that's not honest. It's not transparent. And then the last piece of adjusting can be through emergency or contingency funds. So you mentioned COVID. A lot of city governments are, were not in a good place when mm -hmm. COVID came and they really had to rely a lot on those contingency funds. Um, and, but there's also a limit to that, too. You know, there's a certain percentage that you can use and then you still have to repay it because you got to have a certain bottom line at the end of the year. Um, and the last part we'll get into a little bit later, but reporting. So as similar to monitoring, there's monthly reports that have to come out for operating and capital expenses. And a lot of these can be available to cities on the website. Um, cities, sorry, a lot of these can be available to the public that they can view on the city's website. Mm. So let's break down capital and operating expenses. So your capital expenses are major or minor infrastructure projects. You want to add a new light rail station or add a new runway at the airport or remodel a park. And then your operating expenses are more, okay, we have salaries, we have pensions, we have software, Microsoft Word, Microsoft right, exactly. Teams that we're just paying annually every single year just to keep the building open. Maybe if they're renting out a space, there's like rental Le uh, lease agreements, things like that. Um, it was interesting when I was reading up on New York City's capital expenses, they have a different breakdown for you can't just list anything as a capital expense. It has to serve a public use, serve that public use for the reasonable expectation of the project's duration. So building a light rail station, say near the Capital One Arena, we have to expect that that station is also going to be able to be used by people not attending a Wizards game or something like that. Right. And a lot of times it has to have a certain 
period of time that mm-hmm. it's going to exist. Um, also, sometimes the capital, the tangible thing, the city has to be able to say they have ownership over. Um, so there's a lot of stipulations. A lot of times you can't just use capital funding because capital numbers are, are big and a lot of times it can be planned over years. Yeah, like 10 years. Right. <laughs> there can be plans that go out to that long, but you can't just make up for operating shortfalls with capital. And unfortunately, in a lot of city budgets, the majority of it is spent on operating expenses, not so much. Because think about how often they redo a park or they redo something or add something new, unless it's a road widening. Of course. Right. Of course. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you started talking about reporting. I'm going to jump into accountability. And so the primary way that accountability has been conceptualized is financial accountability. So wanting to be financially responsible in your budget process, making sure you don't over budget, you don't under budget, you don't have too many surpluses, not enough surplus, or even you're in a deficit at the end of the year. Um, And so that's kind of generalized as public accountability. And that's mostly done through the CAFR, which is the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. It's the primary report. That, that name's so aggressive. Like CAFR. <laughs> <laughs> I actually but. like the nickname better than saying comprehensive the, the annual. Name. <laughs> yeah, because, and I'll get into this later, but the primary report that local governments use to say, okay, here's how much we spent. And so if we're in fiscal year 2021, it's for fiscal year 2020. Right. How much we spent last year on expenses, Revenue, salaries, pensions, how much we put into if there say there's a 10 year plan to, I don't know, expand the red line. They want to do one more station out in Maryland. If that's a 10 year plan, they're putting X amount of dollars in it. They need to know, okay, we're in year five of that. And are we 50 percent of the way there? Are we only 25 percent of the way there. And if they're not where their goal was, that's showing in the accountability that we're not reaching our goals. The thing that's interesting about the CAFR is that it's a year behind. And so it's not a very good leading indicator of problems arising in the city because you're reporting from last year. So a lot of people, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board has recommendations to how to make the CAFR a better indicator of like a city's financial management. Mm -hmm. Right, because you can't see it just from looking at numbers and even having a defense about, well, you know, why was this agency... Why did they underspend or why did they mm-hmm. overspend? They can always come up with an answer for why they did, but it doesn't necessarily get into the like reasoning or the rationale behind it. Yeah. That maybe they kept those funds on hold, especially when you think about COVID, is because they didn't know if they were going to be able to fund their they were going to be able to fund mm-hmm. their their salaries, and so they kept that on hold. But at the end, they were able to balance and make it work. But now it looks like they have two hundred thousand dollars that they didn't spend. And yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, that's so irresponsible of them. But and then the reverse of it is okay. We had capital funding towards, let's say, I'm going to keep going to this new train station. Mm -hmm. We wanted to build this new station, but now let's say salaries for construction teams or salaries for engineers or electricians has gone up. And so what we expected to spend in compensation has now risen. And so we were going to be at 25% completion or of funding the project, and now we're only at 15. And yeah, you can justify those rationales, but also the document is so big. Like I looked at DC, it's like 300 pages. Right. So unless there's someone assigned to actually read through this in a meaningful way and comprehend the comprehensive annual financial report, then it's just a big document that's sitting on a table because we have to do it to be an accredited board or something like that. Right. I think we should look at ways to kind of liven up the accountability process to where it's not just checking a box. Because, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of cities are checking that box because they have to. <laughs> yeah. Just like any other thing that they have to do that they might not want to do like the public hearings, which we didn't even get to talk about that much because we kind of breezed through it. But in that legislative process, those committees have to have their public hearings. And so that's going to, you're setting an, okay, I'm an environmental committee. We have X amount of dollars in our budget and we want to hold a public hearing at city hall or whatever. What role does the public really have in saying, actually, I don't want you to, build a new park in that's my about their only role they can have mm-hmm. is they can say their they can say their opinion um and if they have enough kind of teeth behind it or enough people who would be upset then i think that's usually the time where mm-hmm. the city council would say okay we need to look into this or hey let's throw some money at this to, yeah. to make these residents happy but, but the most part it's just we're having a meeting come say something it's more like I'm telling you what we're going to do. I'm right. not really asking you for your opinion, which is unfortunate. Right. Course. They're coming to at this point when people are coming to the table in these public hearings, 
the budget has already been worked on for six months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what are they really, you know, it's in, we're in September. Right. So. So that next part of accountability, which doesn't it's not integrated into the process as it stands now. But what we would like to see integrated in the process is that social accountability. So it's not just that the budget is balanced and that we're fiscally responsible. It's that in this balanced budget, we're servicing all of our residents equally. And so we're not leaving out certain groups of the population. We're not giving too much money to environment and not enough to transportation or not putting all of our money in district one instead of district five, six, and seven and trying to find a balance or a more equitable solution. That's what we really wanted to get into this conversation about is now that we know the process, we know that it starts, I'm just going to pick, I'm not going to look at the federal government or DC. It starts in July and ends in June. And through that time period, each department is putting together a preliminary budget. It's going to the executive and the legislative boards. It's going to committee. It's going to the public. And then it's getting finalized and codified in um, the, ex- the execution stage. We know that there's very limited opportunity for the public to intervene and to change any of those decisions. How can we make the process more equitable, the process more equitable, and then the actual results of the budget more equitable? How would you say, you know, I think people have a lot of different ways they define equity, especially following a lot of the racial, Mm -hmm. the racial injustices that we saw over the summer. How do you think equity should be defined when looking at a city and their budget process? So I think it's fair because you can have it from a sector perspective. So you want to make sure the transportation environment, housing, um, police departments have a fair budget, but you can also think of it in terms of geography. Your city's broken down into seven wards or 18 wards. Are each of the neighborhoods being serviced based on their population size? You can even think of it as what you said, like racial and ethnic equity. Are we, how much money are we spending per person, per neighborhood type, especially in a planning capacity because we know that neighborhoods are so segregated by race and income it's very easy to pick a neighborhood level and you can assess the equity from a racial and income perspective i think the best form because in so many ways race and income are intertwined in a neighborhood Mm -hmm. i'd like to see that as the, the main level of equity i'm less concerned with the balanced budget between police and transportation and fire and more concerned with how each neighborhood is being served yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think as cities look at a lot of times, they'll say we want to apply an equity lens to mm-hmm. this. Um, I think we need to make that a permanent lens. It shouldn't just be something that we pick up and look at and say, OK, well, this is a proposal. Let's let make sure we look at this through an equity lens. What races are is it affecting? Mm-hmm. Very kind of base level surface details. Um, but I think when they make it permanent, they can actually, you know, really intertwine it in how they think. It shouldn't be an afterthought. Thinking that we need to right the wrongs of history and fix certain injustices of the past should Mm -hmm. not be an afterthought. It should be the leading thought that's in these decision makers' minds. It should start really if the beginning process of the budget starts with each of those departments, each of those departments need to have a kind of equity framework in their selection of their expenses, whether that's in their operating expenses, how much money are we going to spend just doing regular day-to-day maintenance in each neighborhood. Because you can drive, even in D.C., you could drive through different neighborhoods and you can tell some streets are more maintained than others. And that's an operating expense that we're choosing not to spend our maintenance budgets in one neighborhood versus another. So it's actually mostly capital. (laughs) And so a lot of reasons why, and this kind of goes back to the execution piece Mm -hmm. that people don't know about a lot. There could be, you know, drastic weather changes of the year. Um, there could be certain parts of the city if they're distributed by, you know, wards or mm-hmm. geographical boundaries. One city might have more miles to cover mm-hmm. than, act, you know, than another. So a lot of times that, you know, isn't quite accounted for when the public is thinking about why are my streets so bad? Mm-hmm. Um, but when you mentioned, the thing, you know, getting the equity piece in the uh, formulation piece, a lot of cities have started to do this. And so an example is Seattle. They were one of the early adopters um, circa 2004, they started the Race and Social Justice Initiative. And through this, they created a racial equity toolkit that assessed policies, initiatives, programs, and the budget. And so they took both an educational approach to educate their staff Mm -hmm. and then to do an assessment. And so through that, they were able to, you know, find different ways that their current policies and programs were not serving both people inside of the government, but also residents. So some of the things after they assessed their kind of equity framework they were able to reduce education requirements to improve access for certain jobs in the public utilities realm. 
um, in their Department of Transportation, they developed a social equity criteria. You were mentioning that about doing project selection mm -hmm. and looking at different funding streams um, and making sure that it is getting at that social both responsibility and accountability for the residents and how they choose pro and how they choose projects because everyone should be able to you know go outside and like what they see. They should be able to have intersections that are safe for them to walk on. But you know if it's very narrow minded, then they might not be doing it in an equitable way. Um, another thing that Seattle did after they looked at that was they did start incorporating it in every proposal. They required all departments to report on their toolkit, their equity toolkit progress um, annually. And they also started working with other cities like Baltimore to implement similar initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, another example was Austin. They took an approach where they included this same framework and assessment while they were creating their budget process. And they've taken a lot of a public facing way to have an equity for, to have an annual tool that departments and the finance team have to use to create okay. the budget. Um, and then they also have a dashboard where they post this publicly. And each department has to have three or four items that are performance based to show that they're meeting their equity goals. So, for instance, the public health department, they were able to have a tracker of both clients that they've seen and their health outcomes over time. Um, they also, which I like, they looked at bike and sidewalk network completion as a framework of equity as well. Um, and so I think these are great resources that are available to the public. And so mm -hmm. people listening who are interested in how to maybe approach their city council with some equity ideas, or if you're listening and you're in government and want to figure out how you can add this to your current process, I think these would be great places to start. Yeah. And I think it's really, I think governments get kind of stressed out about how to add equity into their budget process because typically the person's, working in this realm have accounting degrees or finance degrees and in their education they're thinking numbers math logic they might not be having that same social kind of background right, that exactly. you would get as a planner or as a sociologist or something like that um to say oh wait this is not just a dollar sign these aren't just numbers on a page these are like people that are impacted by services that are exist in their community. I really like, and we talk about this all the time, <laughs> but the I know what you're about to say. <laughs> <laughs> the community mm -hmm. parks initiative in New York City. I think that's a really good example of taking one department and how they can assess their equity from a performance standpoint. And so we talked about it in episode two, I think, when mm -hmm. we talked about public health. But basically, the commissioner of the Parks Department, who is a black man trained as a planner, um, he was looking over the past 20 years how much money was spent on capital improvements for parks across New York City. And when he did that, he found that in that same time period, neighborhoods that were majority white had renovated parks multiple times in the past 20 years for neighbors that were majority Hispanic or majority black hadn't seen any renovation in the past 50 or 30 years. And so he went ahead and changed that. So now when they allocate their funding dollars, they're putting it in the places that haven't had funding in the last 20 years. So I think that's a good example of a temporal and a spatial equity perspective that looks at money spent over time, because that's the thing we're talking about with the CAFR. It's not just a point in time thing. Just because yeah. you drilled money into a service in 2020 doesn't erase everything that happened since 1950. Yeah. You have to kind of back up and see what are the trends and how we can move forward from there. Right. Cause that definitely impacts what people see over time. And even, you know, a place like DC where there are new residents moving in um, and all the time. And these are people who are going to have potential roles in mm -hmm. government or potential roles in even private consulting firms that have a lot of impact on different government services as the government contracts out for these things. And their perspective of D.C., for instance, may not actually reflect the history of the yeah. place. And so I think it's super important. I think we have this kind of understanding from the planning perspective, but it's super important to understand the history of a place, why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe sometimes we even get stuck in that place. Like we think about it. But like you said, if someone who's maybe looking at it, just a spreadsheet yeah. is not making the connection between these numbers and why it matters. And I think that's a good reason why because mayors change right regularly but city council persons typically are there for longer periods of time so i think in the, the strong mayor sense in the strong mayor type of government it's good to have the city council people there to kind of verify because the mayor's coming in with their own agenda mm -hmm. what they want to accomplish in their term but the city council persons have been there for a long period and then the public's been there for even longer right so i would really like to see in the process more influence in the public because and we talked about this with the sports episode that we just recorded, how even if we vote on something and we vote no, 
there's still going to be a way to figure out how it can get done. Right. Um, and I'd, I'd prefer to vote on all of the budget items, even if that means I'm going back to the polls every single year. If that means that I get a chance to say, you know, I really don't want you to spend money on this project. or I don't want my salad, my taxes being allocated this way. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's Drake who says, what do you say? I can I can feed a country with all the money I spend in taxes. <laughs> what they what they do with my money is very troubling. Mm. And J. Cole talks about it too, about how you you spend so much money in your taxes, but you don't get to control how it's being spent. I know if only we could like take the Facebook and Instagram comments and of all the complaints. Because people have a lot of opinions yeah. about how they want, but they just be popping off in the comments, but not necessarily showing up to the to the public hearings, yeah. which is a whole other conversation about the equity of access to certain information. And, and then he, it's I, even when you go to the public hearings, because we have to go to them, you know, in school, like as mm-hmm. assignments, you can kind of tell the city council people are there just to just to hear what you have to say. The, their mind is already made up. You have a time limit. Yeah, you, have you like can't two speak. minutes, and yeah. then you got to be out. So, well, whew, that was a lot. I am, you know, money and policy are injured. You know, it's how things happen. Yeah. It's how decisions get made. If you don't have one, you can't have the other. If they have a policy and there's no money behind it, where does it go? So, you know, and if there's money and there's no policy direction for how to spend it, it's going to get spent however you want to do it. However, they'll use it for something else. quickly. Yeah. And that's what happened. I'm going to bring this up because it it really frustrated me. But that's what happened in Chicago. The city of Chicago got money from Illinois and the federal government over a billion dollars, one point two billion dollars for COVID relief funding to handle all of the stressors that were happening in the city due to coronavirus. And they went ahead and gave almost three million of that money to the police department to back pay police officers and to fund police pensions. And it was, ex- it, it got a lot of media coverage because it was happening during black lives matter, mm-hmm. defund the police. And so we're saying, you know, we want more social services being spent and you take a third of the budget that was just money given to you just out of the blue and still give it to police. Is, was there no better way that you could have spent that money on homelessness services? We're in a pandemic. You couldn't have gave it to the health department. Like that's the best right. you could do was, the police. Yeah. And it's hard because, you know, I think about it from, again, we were talking about the CAFR, like paying for things that you need to pay for Mm -hmm. and trying to be responsible to not be in the red. And so I'm sure they were looking at it from a numbers perspective of, you know, our pensions are underfunded. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, we have to fund this. Um, But that's why you need to have that balance of the fiscal responsibility and your obligation to the people that you serve. Right. So. Well, that's our little brief snippet on the budget. I think this, this is the shortest episode we ever had. <laughs> I know, but you know, I think it's I think it'll be a good primer to a lot of the other conversations that we hope to have in the future. Um, but you know, thanks everyone for listening. We drop episodes every other Tuesday. Um, you can follow us at the number four degrees pod. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple, um, Google, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast. So thanks for rocking with us. Peace out, y'all.